internet and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast hosted by a Makerspace director and two Makerspace aficionados. I am your host tonight, Christian, and joining me are Aaron and Joe. And tonight we're going to be talking about something that I personally have wanted to talk about for quite a while, um, which is going to be a really fun topic. And we got some cool new stuff that we're also going to be bringing up throughout the night. Uh, but first and most importantly, what are you gentlemen drinking tonight? I have a magical unicorn elixir from Obed and Isaac's Brewery. Nice. It is a hazy IPA with stuff in it. <laughs> it's very All that good. Stuff. Yes. I also have a hazy IPA from a local brewery. I'm drinking Industries Walkout. Based on drinking one glass of it the day I got this crowler, this is going to be a fun episode at the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, and myself, I am actually, funny enough, drinking something from another person on this podcast. Um, I am finally breaking into the bourbon that you and Matches brought over. Um, oh, God. And boy, howdy. Uh, is it a good bourbon? <laughs> so I will also have a fun time probably a little bit through this podcast. Um, but yeah, so now that we've jumped into that, let's jump into some of these news topics. The first one and foremost, uh, Lightburn 9 or 0.9. Uh, Joe, you want to talk a little bit about this? Sure. Um, this is was a very big release, but the uh, main features that were brought into it um, were some new camera features that I haven't used yet, so I can't talk too much to. Uh, but there's a new beginner feature that uh, takes some of the a little bit of the control away and and hands it over to the software and the guys that are you know smarter than the beginners and uh, takes a little bit of the dauntingness of setting up a new laser program out. Um, it adds some new, uh, machine support and, uh, I think those were the main ones. It was a, it was a big, big update, a long time coming. I've been testing it for a couple months now and it's been rock solid. So use it almost every day in, uh, nice. my work laser. So, and then after that, we have a exciting con that's coming up. Aaron, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, uh, coming up on April 26th and 27th in Chicago, Illinois, is the very first KeyCon, a convention dedicated solely to uh, KeyCAD. So, it's the first and largest gathering of hardware developers using KeyCAD. Are we going to go to that? I kind of want to, just so I can learn. I kind of want to go, too. Yeah. We should, I mean, we should see if we can figure it out. Sure. They're going to have talks on manufacturing using KeyCAD and how you can use it in your small business or for personal use. Then they go over all the software because KeyCAD is kind of like an umbrella of all these software tools bundled up. And they're going to have best, best practices by experienced electronics designers and how do you, you can use a KeyCAD to make an advanced product. Nice. But yeah, that looks super cool. It's the very first one. Yeah. We might Hurry. just be going. Just uh, just looking over some of the stuff that's coming uh, and some of the keynote speakers that are going, it looks like it is going to be a blast. It looks well, like, yeah, they definitely got some experienced people coming in to, to talk and whatnot. So, yeah. I bet, I, I bet we could get Josh to go with us, too. <laughs> looks like it's a paid thing. Early bird ticket is 100 bucks, and general admission is 125 That's not terrible. It's not terrible. Yeah. If I, I actually know... learn how to use KeyCat out of it, then it might be worth it. Yeah. Yeah, I know we used it for PCB design when I worked at Lulzbot and uh the double E's that used it really liked it. So Yeah. No, nah, it looks awesome. And, and then speaking of Lulzbot, Lulzbot's been Ooh, nice segue. Yeah, right. <laughs> nice segue, bro. <laughs> <laughs> They're usually so hard. This one was so nice. So uh they have been teasing everywhere that you could look about a new machine that is coming out very very soon um i do know that it will be uh its first public appearance will be at murph uh mm. which we will definitely <laughs> be at uh but 
you know, th other than that, if you want to know more about the machine, let me pull my browser back up. You can go to Devel D E V E L dot Alef Objects dot com slash Lulzbot slash Taz slash Quiver, and you can see anything you'd want to know because they're open source and everything's out there on the servers. So uh, a couple things I have gleaned from this, I downloaded the free CAD files. I assembled them on my laptop because I hate myself. And um, <laughs> basically what this looks to be is a high end Taz version uh, looks like it's going to have a large LCD touchscreen thing. Uh, it's Ooh. definitely dual extrusion. Looks like they're doing a dual extru extrusion lift system with dual Titan arrows. Uh, don't hate that. Um, <laughs> and um, it looks like they upped the build volume just a hair with belt drive Zs. Ooh. Also, okay. Also like that. I love me some <laughs> belted Z. So, yeah. looks like it's going to be a solid machine. They took a, looks like they took a lot of lessons learned from the Taz Six and just beefed them up a little bit and uh, produced a really solid machine. Um, I'm guessing this one's going to push them into the Ultimaker comparison market. Um, higher end probably pushing at commercial use i i doubt we're going to see this one priced in the world of makers uh based on where the the market's gone but it's definitely going to be a solid machine from what i've seen in the free cads yeah no that's pretty awesome yeah i can barely uh, justify the the normal 2500 for a taz yeah but i mean especially prepping for murph my taz hasn't not printed in like two months and uh basically the only thing i've done to it is just wipe the bed off I and mean, i'm constantly swapping filaments uh i have a nozzle x on my titan arrow so i've been printing glass fiber polypropylene uh carbon fiber fill polycarbonate like i'm not nice to the machine and it just it just keeps rolling and it well, has for two years so that's actually funny enough. We were talking about this on Thursday. Um, we were giving a class to some students that are coming, uh, that came in this week into the space. And we had a couple of the Lulzbot minis up. Um, and Joe had just offhandedly said that the minis were one of the ones that just, yeah, set it down and it goes. And sure enough, once I got my head out of my butt and actually <laughs> learned how to use the software. Uh, yeah, it did. It literally just like I put the plastic in and it started printing and like I will give credit where credit is due. That was pretty freaking great to just have a printer that was that reliable and I didn't need to do that much to it. At one point, one of my development minis had been printing on its side for like three months straight. I just I had taken apart the electronics enclosure and just never put it back together and just printed with it on its side with its guts all hanging out and it never had a single hiccup <laughs> <laughs> fair enough fair enough well speaking of interesting printers and having printers in interesting circumstances we're going to talk about a topic that i've wanted to talk about for quite a while um and that is misunderstandings that hollywood has about makers um, and common mis misunderstandings that they have about just anything in general when it comes to making something, um, and especially in the movies. And this just... has come up quite a few times at the space, especially because a lot of us are movie junkies. Um, but I think the real one that brought it to a head, and I was like, I want to freaking talk about this already was Ocean's 8. Oh, um, God, I forgot. It. <laughs> so in Ocean's 8, there is a scene where um, some of the women are scanning a diamond necklace and they're using this really stupid scanner um, that's creating a 3D model. Um, and then they're able to print 
a diamond necklace to be able to replicate what is happening with a maker uh, bot. Yeah, with a maker bot, which is a whole nother thing. <laughs> Not... Yeah, yeah. They just like roll out a MakerBot Z18, and they're like, "This is going to create a perfect replica that no one will ever notice." <laughs> and it's just like it's one of the most atrocious things that I've ever seen them actually try to do. And so um, when I saw that, because as I've said, I work in the movie industry, I see a lot of movies. When I saw that one in particular, I was like, "We have to talk about this. We have to at least give." give some riff to um, some of the common misconceptions that have happened over the years um, and just go into that. So um, that was going to be my first one that immediately I thought about. Um, I've got plenty stocked up all across the board from hacking to maker bot or to, to 3d printing to other weird displays and whatnot. But do you guys have any that you want to jump into? You guys have seen Fast and the Furious, right? <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> I want to talk about Tej for a minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm too fast, too furious. We get to meet a new character, and his name is Tej. And it's Ludacris with a giant Ludacris afro. And I... Instantly loved him because he was such a smart ass and he was so much fun. But Tez was the mechanic that could make anything run, right? He could fix anything. And that was believable. And then three movies later, you get Tez, the, the tech, the tech guy that like he went from fixing skylines in his Florida garage to hacking the CIA <laughs> and and like, hack, what was it, GoldenEye or... What was yeah. the what was the software in in the last couple where they could track anyone anywhere? And he's mm -hmm. like, narrowing down, narrowing down. And they're like <laughs> going back and forth with that giant screen and that incredible display. I want my computers to look like that, damn it. <laughs> it's well, I mean, if 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 we're gonna go straight into hacking, we <laughs> we have to talk about the golden child that is loved by all but understanding where it sits or where it sits which is hackers like <laughs> hackers although a beautiful movie like through and through that is a beautiful movie and near and dear to i think every one of our hearts that movie is so trash when it comes to <laughs> and it's it's so funny because like even shows that are to the point of where they are um, now, uh, make fun of that. Um, and the, the big one that comes to mind is Mr. Robot. Mr. Mm. Robot legitimately in one of the scenes, they're watching hackers and they go, man, I wish hacking was like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't just us writing code in the back in console and just like, no, it, it's not that fun. Like hackers has such this personification of what hacker or hacking is, and it's nothing like that. But even so Mr. I thought you're gonna Robot broke broke that. Well, yeah. yeah, they they dramatized some of it, but I would say Mr. Robot was it was more in line with some stuff, and I felt like it was more rooted. I mean, a little bit like there was the time where they hacked the building with a Raspberry Pi just like dropped in an air vent. Like, no, well, it wasn't dropped in an air vent. It was hooked up to an electronic thermostat that did have a networking port ran to it. Aaron, IOT guy. Wait, what you <laughs> it, said it actually happened a month or two ago. Oh, I don't know if you guys heard that. There was a ras there was a real Raspberry Pi um, in, in a company. Nice. And it was it was silently collecting stuff off the network, so it's it is possible. Excellent. <laughs> all, right. all right, all right. See, they they were grounded. They were somewhat grounded. I will absolutely say that a lot of Mr. Robot was over dramatized crap, but they were somewhat grounded in some of it. Oh yeah, and I love that show. Like, oh, over yeah. over dramatized no, at all. I love Fast and the Furious and Tej. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> I thought you were going to go with uh, Swordfish for that oh, last example. God. With Hugh Jackman. That, uh, okay. that scene with Hugh Jackman. Yeah. It was like the best hacking scene 
<laughs> There's <laughs> just like going all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's one of the fair. Well, I mean, and if we're going to go into something really, really modern, um, it came out just a little bit ago. I don't know if you guys have seen this yet. Uh, have you guys seen the new Lost in Space uh, series that Netflix put out? No, I okay. really want to. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So it's been out for a little bit. It's not super recent, but it's been out. Uh, there is a part in there where, and you see this in a lot of modern sci-fi movies, where they print a working gun and they just print it completely. And what's even greater is it's printed on a cupcake and somebody had a cupcake on set, brought it, sat it down, and that's what printed it. And was in just Lost like, in Space? Yeah, it was basically the guts of a cupcake. And that's that's what it was. Yeah. It like they they took off the plat or the, the wood shell and just put up plexi. And that was it. But it looked through and through like a cupcake. Like <laughs> But and then they're like they have the computer next to it and it's like printing gun. Oh, you need credentials for this. Oh, now I have the credentials and all of a sudden starts printing this gun. It it happens in so many things. The other thing was there was the new series that um JJ Abrams uh uh what's the name of that Cloverfield Cloverfield mm. Paradox they do it in there as well. Like oh, so yeah. Many, yep. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. It was, oh, that was a dumpster fire. It was a great dumpster <laughs> fire, but it was a dumpster fire. <laughs> um, so many of these modern sci-fi shows like have this perception of you can pr- like you can print a working gun that works exactly how it is. And it's like, no. And, it, and like to the point of where it like prints it with springs and slides and everything like that. And it's like, no, no, this is not how it works at all. Well, <laughs> I mean, if they're set that far in the future, like, like there's a whole thing that can be said. Like, have you ever heard of a von Neumann probe? No. Like, okay. Uh, okay. So, um, this isn't a movie. It's a book. Uh, it's a book called uh, "We Are Legion, We Are Bob," and it's a wonderful book. Uh, oh yeah, you've told me I need to uh, listen to this. Anyway, just look that up. Um, and um, it is about a a guy who got turned into a von Neumann probe, and the idea, the whole idea of a von Neumann probe is it's like a rep rap. Um, it is a space probe that you send out into space, and then it is equipped with. Uh, molecular 3D printers or um, equipment that are similar where it can go uh, collect uh, elemental um, materials and use them to manufacture itself again um, and iterate upon itself. So like when you're talking about 3D printing on a, on a level where you're, you're bringing elements together and you're creating materials there's there's really no reason why you couldn't. And we're starting to see that happen in like the electronics 3D printing where we're printing PCBs and indexing materials and ending up with like almost functional stuff. Like we can't print a semiconductor yet, but we're not far from that. Well, and I think what irritates me is that it's not the fact that we can't do it because I think we can, especially with Da, 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 the tool changer, you could absolutely do some pick and place stuff to be able to put in springs and pins and all that kind of stuff in mid print. The thing that I want is if you're going to try and go and say, hey, we can do this in a movie, do it in a rooted way where it actually is true. Don't just be like 3D printing. It solves all the issues because it doesn't like it's not meant to be like that. There is a possibility just do it right. <laughs> like that's yeah, all I want. Especially if you're um showing current tech. But that's no yeah. fun. That's not the buzz. Yeah, I I get it. Like I do. Like there's so much so many people who are just want the like the catch and they don't want to have to explain it. But at the same time, I'm just like, man, it'd be so nice if like they actually did their research into what was kind of going into what was happening. Cause like ugh. Okay, I I've been talking for a little bit. Anybody anybody else got some more examples? I have a I have a question for both of you. 
Okay. Slight tangent. What is your favorite maker in any movie? Ooh. Well, there is um there's the quintessential Doc Brown. Like that guy. Ooh, he's he's my yeah. favorite mad scientist. He can make anything from anything. Like I can travel in time based on garbage. Like that's amazing. And then the scientist who ends up making Johnny Five has always held a special place in my heart because huh. he's so goofy okay. and, and he's just an idiot, but he makes like this, this wonderful piece of AI tech, you know, that was never supposed to happen. And it, it's just, just wonderful. I, okay. I would have to go with probably the one that got me really, really, really into just sci-fi in general. Um, watching it as a kid, um, I don't know if the character actually... I know he has a name, but I can't remember what it is. But um, H.G. Wells, The Time Machine. Um, oh. There was a movie in 2002 that came out for it. Um, and it was one of the first movies that I ever really got into because of time travel. Because it, it, it had this really interesting perspective of going back and forth. And it had the cause and effect constantly happening and it it was i i don't know it felt really well done to me um and that like him going through the making of the time machine and like having to deal with this um perplexing of his creation um like that always held a special place in my heart uh, yeah uh if it was any other person besides that as a maker probably would be um uh, it's David. What's his last name? Um, uh, David Jackson. Uh, Stargate. David Jackson. Um, probably one of my favorite like nerds on extra, screen. Extra nerd cred. Oh nice. yeah, That's SG One reference. man. <laughs> I have an, those... I, ha I have another one. Okay. Q from James Bond. Oh hell yeah! <laughs> <sighs> yeah. No, that's absolutely like e either Q or um, like any of the James Bonds, Kingsmen, like any of those like super nerd gadget creators are always that's always fun. Yeah, it's just every new James Bond movie. I always just looked for the Q branch scene where it's like, <laughs> what new and interesting things are you going to see? And uh, and and he gets to break. Yeah. What about yeah. you, Aaron? So, my favorite, he is known for his, he's making these elaborate mechanisms and these elaborate machines that he uses to kind of, you know, teach people, you know, teach, you know, kind of help them learn from their past mistakes, which has really, really resonated with me. <laughs> his name okay. is Jigsaw. Wait. Jigsaw <laughs> from the Saw series. Oh, I knew exactly where you were going. <laughs> Audience, you you can't exactly see Wait. what we're happening because we're recording audio only. <laughs> but I face palmed about as hard as you can imagine. <laughs> I had that one planned all day. I mean, he is he's such an original creator. Yeah, uh, he's very intuitive. I'll give him that. <laughs> Like, absolutely. <laughs> oh, man, that's too good. That's that's really good. <laughs> You're welcome. No, but for seriously. Uh, the thing that got me going as a kid was the original Tomb Raider with uh, Angelina Jolie. Um, right. her, her, her friend that, that did all the mechanic stuff. I remember she like ran into his apartment, his his like trailer or something to get him to do something. He had all these little robot companions that he made, <laughs> and they just kind of like wobble around. They're yep. like just very simple robots. I'm like, oh, that's so neat. He made his friends. <laughs> <laughs> I could make friends too. I could, I could make friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! No, but that always stuck with me. Um, yeah. No, Jigsaw. absolutely. Jigsaw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's that's pretty good <laughs> oh. there was a uh a recent movie um it, it's 
as far as I know, it's still in the theaters that uh, has a little girl maker in it. And uh, it just killed me because it reminded me so much of my daughter and uh, 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 Wonder Park. Yep. Is that Wonder Park? Yeah. Yeah. It's still in theaters. Yeah, the the little girl in that movie, she makes so many cool little theme park things, and she just makes them out of anything. And uh, I just i I love that um, that ability for kids in movies to just create these insane things, like like the Sandlot, when they had the um, the giant erector set thing. Yeah, that they lowered the truck yeah. through. Those kids had a lot of erector set. What did their parents do for a job? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I uh, remember like, that stuff. I didn't have that much. <laughs> it's it's super cool cuz like I mean for me personally there was so much um there was so much movies and uh, eventually what would become YouTube and all that kind of stuff that did influence me as as a maker. Um, and still to this day, I can't tell you how many like videos I've shared with the two of you guys that um, of things that I found on like repeat on either Facebook or YouTube that I'm just like, this is freaking awesome and I want to make it. And it's just like so much media has had an impact on me as a maker. Um, and that's why like I I love like talking about this stuff because I think especially like the the ideological maker for me personally if we're going to go way out there and be like this would be so freaking cool has to be Tony Stark cuz Tony Stark is Tony Stark like I mean, that's people are I mean, what they are yeah <laughs> it's 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 one of those things where it's like to be able to be the maker that he is would be on another freaking level <laughs> but hey, it like there's no there's no elements that will keep my heart going i'll just make another one it's fine we'll just add yeah. a, a block to the periodic table it's cool we're in <laughs> hardware <laughs> mode guys <laughs> so joe what well, would be your ultimate maker self as um, character dr vankman from uh, okay. Ghostbusters. Like I can never be Egon. I can't I can't be that serious. I can't be that organized. You know, but I can I can take that guy and I can like make him have a little bit of a good time and keep keep everyone together and like still do some makey stuff. Like <laughs> yeah, I I, I I always tell people I'm the Dr. Vankman of engineers and about one sixth of people get it. <laughs> Jeez. Those people are my friends, typically. Aaron, nice. what about you, man? Hmm. Probably a tie between Dexter from Dexter's Laboratory. Yeah. And Dr. Horrible. From Dr. Horrible sing along a vlog? Yeah. Fuck yes. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Dude, I'm not into musicals, but Fuck me if that movie is not good. That's that great. is amazing. Like, I'm sorry, we just got explicit, but that movie is so good. NPH so can good. do no wrong. It's fine. It's fine. No, nah, like <laughs> I, oh, it's so good. Well, okay, that takes me into another cool thing. So I don't know if you guys have seen. Have you guys watched um uh, a series of unfortunate events? Yes, I've seen most of it. I haven't seen. Okay. The I don't think I finished the latest season, but I've seen most of it. That, like, I, so I don't have kids. I never will. Um, it's just something that it's not for me. But I feel like that would be, like, the coolest series for, like, kids growing up, and especially to encourage making, because it makes some of the coolest freaking contraptions in that show that are just, like, freaking awesome. And I feel like as a kid, if I would have gotten to watch that, it just would have inspired me even more, because it's just, like, these fantastical creations that they're just coming up with spur of the moment. Did you and know my daughter the books? loves that show? The Fair books enough. were super popular when we were little. Like I, that and Harry Potter. Yeah. I I unfortunately did not, but I now that like I've seen That is this, an unfortunate event in itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right. I'm here all night. Oh <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
but no like that that just sorry that just reminded me like mph in that just him and um uh uh nathan fillion were some of my favorite characters uh, in that. he's and always this. good too yeah oh yeah in everything <laughs> i'm just surprised but, at how good felicia day was in that and dr horrible yeah Oh yeah, no, she like she brought it. Like it was, it was two like big actors and then an internet star, and it yeah. was it was amazing. such a good cast. It was perfect. Yeah. Did you see they added the guild to Netflix? I did, and I plan on rewatching that very yeah, soon. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but all right, any more like any other things you guys want to go out on? Oh man, there's so many. Hmm. Well, I just poured this shitty apple pie thing again, so we have to. We got time still. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think. So, Joe, you're playing Sunset Overdrive, right? Yes. Did you get to the part where you have to 3D print an airplane propeller? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Hey. I mean, like, y- maybe. <laughs> it man my, okay my, my favorite is when like you go to like you're in a movie and you go to this guy's lab and this the lab is like super high tech and in the background they have a crappy chinese clone 3d printer that they're hoping somebody's gonna catch on to um like this didn't happen in fringe but the labs in Fringe were always full of things that weren't sciencey, but looked sciencey, and like they were perfect stand-ins for like having a really cool physics lab. But man, they were they no, no. <laughs> I love that I show mean, so much. I'll give them a pass. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that show was amazing. I loved it. If we are gonna jump into video games, I have to bring forth the ultimate sin. Um, that I think would would basically make any maker cry, uh, which is Watch Dogs. Um, Never played. Do that. you guys know about Watch Dogs? Isn't that where you just hack things from a smartphone? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so essentially, what I will explain Watch Dogs uh, one and two very condensedly. Um, Watch Dogs one essentially there is funny enough it happens in Chicago. Uh, they create this thing called the CTOS, which is the central uh, system, something, blah, blah, blah. And everything runs on this system from street lights to security cameras to uh, litter, like uh, cash registers and everything. Everything is on this centralized network. And Wait, they say isn't that most- Skynet? Pre- mm, really close. <laughs> um, but essentially, they say that they have this most secure network in this black hat hacker is going to show him up because some people up at the top killed his family. And so he goes around hacking the entire city on his smartphone. Literally is you just like on your smartphone going, Oh, I don't like those lights. Okay. I'm going to change them. Oh, I don't like that. The pressure in this like pipe, I want to like get rid of the police behind me. I'm going to make a valve explode under them from my smartphone in the exact position I'm in. Let so me that's open the Watch hack Dog. app. Oh yeah, from the hack app. Uh, that's Watch Dogs 1. Watch Dog 2 gets even bonkers where they like have you hacking from a little RC drone and you just like um, roll through like people's houses and are just like hacking all the things from the well, little RC drone. That's a See, thing. Sort no, it's not. I saw so I I read a research paper where they were able to use an actual drone and fly up to a house and they were able to insert a worm into their smart light bulbs. Oh, from I remember outside that. Inside the house and yeah, then we the worm then self-propagated. This. Yeah. So Yeah, but like in the same time there was a hacker group that shot a um a phone address list across the San Francisco Bay using Bluetooth with a Bluetooth like sniper rifle. And they were demonstrating that you could like just as easily pull that from across the Bay. Like 
just because you can doesn't mean you will or should or it will happen in a way that's like I don't well, know. Now I want a Bluetooth sniper rifle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I want to know what a Bluetooth sniper rifle is. I want to measure is. how lethal that can be. It it looked a can lot you... like a Y fry, if you remember that little hack from back in the uh, day. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but it had a Bluetooth radio in it. And like the whole idea of Bluetooth is it's only active within like ten or fifteen feet. So right. it's it, and there's supposed to be that handshake. Well, they were able to brute force the handshake and steal this person's contact information off their phone. And this was back in like the flip phone days when Bluetooth was like a, an idea, not a thing. I don't know. It, yeah. <laughs> so what you're saying is we can make a Wi-Fi sniper rifle and just shoot people with it and give them access. <laughs> then take it away. We could we could just yeah, call it the, the, Starbucks 5G and give it to everybody, and everybody would join immediately. And then it'll mutate their genes. Pretty oh. much. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, man. This is a good trouble, episode. I'm having trouble keeping my thoughts straight. There, there's a lot. Uh, like it, Walk the, out. I should have walked out on you. Um. <laughs> uh, Ooh, so clever, Joe. You used its name against itself. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking A. What about the hackers from um, Jurassic Park? Like, in the, oh, in the yeah. original one? Yes. What's his name? I can't remember. Um, Newman. Oh, I'm going to look it up. Newman. Yep, that's right. You're right. You're right. That yep. Newman. <laughs> I I love how minor of a role Samuel L. Jackson played in that movie, and like now he doesn't show up if he's not a main character. That is so fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's there's just there's a lot. There's this is something that like. And it, it, the the funny thing is, the minute that we stop, there's going to be like 14 that come to mind. Of, I've been like, thinking about this all day, and so I, I I've been having trouble. And I knew as soon as we started talking, they would just like come become a flood. So yeah. Big Hero Six. Yes. Okay. Yes. They've got, in the very beginning, he's got that awesome like distributed fighting robot that just tiny little. <laughs> With wedges. the magnetic servo bearings. Yeah, it's yep. like, yeah, yeah, it's like, <laughs> awesome idea, but there's no, how would that kid make that? <laughs> <laughs> with with the tools he had available. I, I, I loved his, uh, his 3D printer when he was making Baymax armor. Like, I, for a long time now, I have wanted to build a 3D printer based around that design. Like, <laughs> it would never work the same because, you know, I'm not going to make armor out of like PETG, but, you know, like I I'm not going to crap on your dreams. That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but his whole workshop was honestly kind of based in reality. Nothing he really had other than his 3D scanner wand, like was something that we don't have now. In the scanner one, it was far fetched, but not that far fetched. No, like it there. We do have 3D scanners that are somewhat accurate and can pull a good 3D model. Just not like that. Oh, I got a whole new topic. Oh, Let, let's finish. Let's finish this and I'll, I'll go to it. OK, OK. Well, so Aaron, do you have any more ones that you want to you want to um, jump in on? Yeah. So back to the video games. I okay. feel like the the Team Fortress engineer sets an unrealistic expectation <laughs> for what it takes to build a turret. <laughs> it the is Team not Fortress as easy engineer, as it's engineering it's just, shaming me. <laughs> it's just not as easy as taking a wrench and then just whacking things together. I I don't know. I think a little American ingenuity does a lot for a lot. I don't know. <laughs> Much like the Kerbal Space Program programmers. <laughs> oh, what a great game! Yeah, that you know what's so cool about that one though is 
how based in reality it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like how much you actually, it, they force you to take real life scenarios, like even down to like mild wind movements will totally affect your launch. Yeah. Like, Oh yeah. That's. My... <sighs> so I've seen people make Gundams in that game, which what? makes me, yeah, they made an actual Gundam. It looked like a jet plane and it flew up and then it just morphed. <laughs> this is my morphing. <laughs> <laughs> thing more in, into a Aaron's Gundam, wiggling like a wacky, wacky wailing flyable two, two man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they did all that in Kerbal Space Program, which makes me, you know, disappointed in our government that we don't have that yet. <laughs> NASA, because... why aren't you getting on this? <laughs> well, a according to NASA, Sam Kerbal is very accurate in the calculations that you have to do for like launching and everything. He's he said it's pretty spot on. So fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So the, we need more Gundams. <laughs> the the tangent I was going to take is um movies and I'm going to branch this off into books because there's two in in particular I want to talk about, and one of them was made into a movie. Okay. But movies and books that predicted the future in a way that's fucking terrifying. How accurate it was. Please don't. I, I know one of them. Unfortunately, I'm thinking. Which one? Go for it. I think we all know. I, well, I was, the first one that I was going to say was Idiocracy. Oh, oh. Let, let's. I mean, let, yes. But let's leave the oh. horrifying nature of our current status out of this and just <laughs> stick to technology. Okay. 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 <laughs> so there's two that come to mind, and the one that was made in a mo into a movie was Ender's Game. Have you guys Ooh, okay. Have you guys read Ender's Game? Uh, no. no, I need to listen to your audiobooks that you have in your server. <laughs> Come back to me in five years when you've caught up, all right? Uh, so, um, Ender's Game was written in the mid-70s, and at the time, it predicted iPads in a way that's absolutely terrifying. Um, it predicted certain ways that we interact with technology today in a way that is just scary, scary, scary accurate. The iPad or versus like tablet computer thing is just insane. Like, so the way they use the tablets in the movies, have you guys seen the movies? Yeah. Okay. No. Uh, well, you know what? Go home, Aaron. Just, just, I am just home. <laughs> turn your webcam <laughs> off and just be out of this. No. Um, the way they interact with the tablets in the movies was not made accurate to today's standards. That's how it was in the book that was written in the mid 70s. Um, Basically, they like they go to school and they play simulation games that are are scary accurate on these tablets, and um, they they do all of their classwork on the tablet and everything like that. And uh, they were called desks in the book, um, but the way they interacted with them and the information they were given and all of that was just like horrifyingly accurate to how we work with you know like technology today. Like it, it right. Just, been written 40 years ago and then the other one that i was going to bring up was um is called way station and it's by an author called by the name of clifford simak uh and i wanted to see the published date uh because i think it was written in the 40s so it's not 1984 oh no uh 1963 <laughs> So Way Station is about a guy who um, at the turn of the century met up with aliens and he was a, uh, a soldier in the Civil War and he became a waypoint for an intergalactic uh, like travel system. So they could jump from planet to planet, but they could only jump so far. And so they had way stations set up on different planets where they had vats of um, elements and minerals and everything else. And basically, when you got transported, you were 3D printed from your elemental basis in this vat. And then you'd hang out in the way station for a couple days and then you would get into another one and then you would be dissolved and your essence would be transferred to the next way station. 
And so quantum teleportation. Yes. That's, exactly. that's, that's the entire basis of that. And in, huh. in, in 1963, Clifford Simak like wrote a book all about this. And in the book, they talked about virtual reality in a way that's very similar to how we deal with it now. He had a shooting gallery in his basement to keep his um, accuracy with his rifle very sharp. And the, the shooting gallery uh, was was very similar to our re- virtual reality. They predicted uh, 3D printing and apparently quantum teleportation. And like, yeah, this is this is sci-fi written a long time ago. That's just like scary accurate and super fun. So do, do you guys have examples of that? I have a philosophical question. For sure. Both of you. All right. In the context of quantum teleportation, where yourself at point A gets obliterated and its structure stored, transported to point B and reconstructed out of nanoparticles or elements or whatever, would your do you think your consciousness would be replicated? Or would original Aaron be destroyed and an exact clone replica of Aaron be constructed at point B, even if it has all the same memories and knowledge and experience, would it still be original Aaron or would it be copy Aaron? Copy Aaron. I agree. Yeah. This is what keeps me up at night. (laughs) (laughs) That's... Oh, that's an interesting one. As much as I want teleportation, I don't know if I would ever use it. Yeah, it but it doesn't matter if it's copy Aaron. I think original Aaron cares, since he would be destroyed. So that brings up a whole nother question. Like the teleporters that they have in like Starfleet and then a lot of other sci fi, they deconstruct your body on a molecular level and put it back together on the other end. Right. When they put it back together on the other end, why do I still have blaster wounds <laughs> and cancer on that side? Why isn't all that stuff just fixed? Uh, and hmm. and can it be? Because it would Filter be a lot the bad more... shit when you reassemble me, please. Yeah, like I'd be a lot more okay with Copy Joe if Copy Joe didn't have any diseases or defects or anything like that because the system was just like, hey. Apparently, you have a blaster bolt here. Let's just fill this back in with healthy tissue. You're good now. Like, that would be pretty rad. Why hasn't anybody done that in as a concept? I mean, even in Star Trek, I don't even think the teleportation stuff is perfect. So no. I think there's several examples where someone just doesn't make it back because the transmission got garbled. Yes. Well, yeah. They've, like, there's several episodes where, like, they've had people end up in the middle of rocks. Because they just didn't do the calculations correctly or stuff like that. Or like Galaxy Quest. <laughs> where he gets... Fucking Galaxy Quest. He gets teleported inside up. <laughs> Fuck. No, like, that <laughs> does bring up some interesting questions. Huh. Yeah. I had a question first, damn it. Go all for right, it. All right. I don't know. Like, do you guys have other examples of movies before their time that predicted our future in a way that is uncomfortably accurate? Besides 1984? <laughs> I, again, like technology, not necessarily political status. Although 1984 is shut. It's up. <laughs> it's it's got some stuff. Um, 2001: Space Odyssey had some stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. There were some. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that there was definitely some stuff in there that was very much future esque. Um to the point of the space station is basically almost modernized at this point. Like that is a modern space station that they're supposedly on several years even from now. Yeah, it, his is less creepy though, because like he was a consultant to NASA. As he was writing those books. So, like, like some of that is, that's why those books were so good, because they were based in, in, like, true theory. 
Right. Um, it's kind of like the same idea with all of the uh, uh, Asimov books. Like they were based in sound theory because Asimov was a physicist and a scientist and was like working on the projects that he was writing books about the future of. It, it, I mean, and that's what makes, I feel like that is what makes the best sci-fi or best like future predicting stuff is when you are so grounded in that stuff. And that, yeah. I think that brings it full circle it, it, on any good note that you could have is if you want to make a good movie, have it somewhat based in reality. Don't use a cheap gimmick to make a fun thing seem fun like if you want to make it good have it somewhat based in reality to where we can all enjoy it like yeah because it's only going to make it more appealing when you see those things that was super unintentional but really good <laughs> but well, do oh, you guys the, have any the full circle yeah yeah i mean yeah. like <laughs> Like, what's so creepy about, like, Ender's Game was Orson Scott Card wrote that when he was in high school. So, really? Like, yeah, he, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like he was well-researched and, you know, doing research on um, any sort of technology. This was, like, something that he did for a, a high school project. Huh. So. Okay. Are yeah. we sure he's not a time traveler? Well, I mean, he did turn out to be a giant bigot, so there was that. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> you know what else is eerily very similar to current reality? What? The Necronomicon. <laughs> <laughs> did you guys read the Cryptonomicon? I need to. You do. I have the audiobook. Uh, it's very long. It's incredible. Um, I I I'd love a modern version of the Cryptonomicon with an extra storyline built in, because like the whole concept is there's three storylines and they're um, they're about twenty years separated, and the newest storyline was written at current day, which was a, about like turn of the century, year two thousand era, um, and they all played into each other. I'd love a new version. Um, Neil Steven, if you listen to this our podcast, you should write this. <laughs> I love an up <laughs> a new version of the Cryptonomicon where it's like all built together and then there's somebody built you know, somebody this a character based in this time period. I mean like, it was all built on uh cryptography and y you guys would both love it. Like, oh, Chris, sure. you drive enough like you would finish the audiobook in like three days. So just get on it. <laughs> that's that's going to be my um, hashtag Murph 2019 audiobook that I listen to on the drive. <laughs> it's it's 45 hours. So you'll have just to drive, drive back and forth well. a couple times. Okay. <laughs> Ride your bike. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just walk. Just walk. It'll be fine. <laughs> you know, you'll get there. <laughs> get there eventually. Oh, man. Okay. Anything else, guys? I made no. all the jokes I needed to make. All I, the jokes I needed to make. I have so many sci-fi references. This podcast could get so long. If anybody ever wants to geek out about sci-fi books with me, you know where to find us on the interwebs. Absolutely. And that, I think that is a good way to end it out. Um, thank you for listening to Makers on Tap. Um, if you haven't already, consider following us on social from Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, and all the other sources. Um, please consider leaving a review on our podcast. We love hearing your guys' feedback and being able to improve in any way that we can. Uh, and with that, thank you for listening and hope you have a fantastic week. Keep making stuff. Also, this is the end of the podcast. Ah, oh, you stole my line, you dick. Suck it. <laughs> <laughs>